Good evening and welcome to St. Michael's Cathedral in Kelowna, BC, and to a service, a, a Celtic evening liturgy. Just a note before we begin, next week we will begin to have services in the morning and the service will be available online at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Stay with us, for day is ending. With friend, with stranger, with young and with old, be among us tonight. Come close to us that we may come close to you. Forgive us that we may forgive one another. Renew us so that where we have failed, we may begin again. Amen. Amen. We light a light in the name of the Maker, who lit the world and breathed the breath of life for us. We light a light in the name of the Son, who saved the world and stretched out his hand to us. We light a light in the name of the Spirit, who encompasses the world and blesses our souls with yearning. We light three, three lights, lights for the, for the Trinity, Trinity of love. Of love. God, God above us, God beside us, God beneath, beneath us. The beginning, beginning the end, end, the everlasting one. one. The, the love of Christ, of Christ between us and each love. O oh God, who brought us to the bright light of this new day, carry, carry us, us through to its, its ending. ending. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. May we find peace in your service, and in the love of the world to come, see you face to face. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our psalm is number 119, found in the BAS on page 875, beginning at verse 105. Thank you. 
life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your love. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them, and when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau, because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking in a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. And Jacob said, first, Sell me your birthright. And Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Yes, 
reading from the Gospel of Matthew. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen, Hear, then, the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Lord, now you now let, let your, your servant, servant go in peace. peace. Your, your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us confess our faith as we say, We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of male and female. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the poor, tortured and nailed to a tree. A man of sorrows, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth, to the place of death. 
On the third day he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the Church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of eternal life. Amen. Amen. Holy One, you have promised to hear us when we pray in the name of your Son. Therefore, in confidence and trust, we pray for the Church. As we open our sanctuary next Sunday for in-person worship, we ask your Holy Spirit to continue to hold each member of the congregation and the clergy in your loving arms during this time of COVID. May your holy presence enliven the church for its mission in the world, that we may be salt of the earth and light for the world. Breathe fresh life into your people. Give us the power to reveal Christ in word and action. We pray for the world. We pray for one another, our families and friends through whom we learn to love and be loved. Thank you for all who care for us, for healthcare workers, police, paramedics, firefighters, and others who are stressed at this time with long hours required to be of service. We thank you for the unfailing love you hold out to everyone in Jesus Christ. Comfort and heal those in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble. We ask your blessing upon Stuart, Dennis and Janice, Derek and Jane, Anne and Gordon, Patty, Shay and Mark, Robin and Linda, Shelley Lynn, Ryan and family, Vivian and Ted, Deborah, Lane, and the Hope family. Give them courage and hope in their distress and bless those who minister unto them. We pray for those who have asked for our prayers and those in your heart at this time. Living as we do in this beautiful Okanagan Valley, we remember with gratitude your many gifts to us in creation and the rich heritage of our land. Help us and people everywhere to share with justice and peace the rich resources of the earth. Give wisdom to all in authority among us and to all leaders of the nations. We pray for the leaders of the nations. We remember all who have died from this pandemic and from other causes, and we rejoice at the faithful witness of your saints in every age, praying that all may enter with them into the unending joy of your heavenly kingdom. God of mercy, you have given us grace to pray with one heart and one voice and have promised to hear the prayers and longings of your people as may be best for us and for your kingdom. Grant in this world to know your truth and in the world to come to see your glory. Amen. God, our creator, on windswept beaches, your saints of old held their hands up to you in wonder and amazement felt your power through the roar of wind and surf. Exposed to the elements, they felt a unity with the one who had created all things. Forgive our unwillingness at times to follow in the footsteps of these saints, to meet you in the solitude of your creation. Forgive our unwillingness to get our feet wet. And as we are touched by the blessing of your merciful love, May we join with all of your creation in praising you, O Holy One, through the fragrance and melody of our lives. 
Amen. Amen. Teach us now, O Christ, to pray as brothers and sisters. Our Father in heaven, eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, Father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. Hallowed be your name. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. a stone for a pillow, author Madeline Lengel reflects on the relationship between Isaac and Rebekah's two sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau was a more primitive personality than Jacob, says Lengel. He lived for the moment, with little thought of the morrow or the consequences of his impulses. When he came home from hunting, famished and saw that Jacob had made a delicious stew of rice, lentils, and onions, the smell was too much for him and he asked Jacob to give him a bowlful. Jacob's response, writes Lengel, was hardly generous. He demanded Esau's birthright as the price of a mess of pottage. Because Esau was famished and because that moment was all he was thinking about, he let Jacob track him, trick him, and to fill his immediate need, he thoughtlessly gave away his birthright as eldest son. While this was merely imprudent of Esau, it was a thoroughly dirty trick on Jacob's part. 
While it is true that Jacob, rather than Esau, went on to become what Lengel calls the third person in the trinity of patriarchs, which we inherit from the Hebrew scriptures, not Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, but Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Reading the story of these two brothers leaves me with the strong feeling that each of them had a lot of growing up to do, and a lot of stupidity and bad behavior to answer for. This then leads me to wonder how either of them could ever have been seen as someone with whom God would get involved. The early portion of today's Genesis reading, however, tells us that God was involved long before this. The story of Jacob and Esau, rather than describing a tale of two warring siblings, is instead a metaphor of two warring nations. While in Rebekah's womb, one of the Genesis writers tells us, the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. The descendants of Esau became the Edomites, while the descendants of Jacob became the Israelites, and there would be long-lasting hostility between them. As the story of Esau and Jacob portrayed a metaphor for the history of the Edomites and the Israelites, so too does the enmity of the Edomites and the Israelites provide a metaphor for the long history of wars among the world's nations, wars that have stretched the length of human history. Rather than leaving me to wonder how Jacob could ever have become such a significant person in the unfolding of Judeo-Christian salvation, I am instead left with a feeling of awe, an awe that is provoked by what can only be described as God's unrelenting and unconditional desire to love us, in spite of the obstacle course that we create to prevent this from happening. In other words, even if only for a short moment, stories like the one about Jacob and Esau have the capacity to take me out of what is essentially my rather cynical view of the world and transport me to a world where there is a God who has the capacity to forgive this kind of stupidity and bad behavior and ultimately transform it into something good and filled with promise. In preference of choosing to pack it in, I make a choice to find the good bits and pluck them out hoping and praying that God, with the help of human hands, will find a way for the good bits to overcome what often seems like an insurmountable amount of bad bits. I dare say that I haven't been the only one in recent days who has been digging through some pretty bad soil in the hopes of discovering some good stuff that will provide all of us with the strength to withstand life's current onslaught and to find a way to stay alive. And not just to stay alive, but to stay alive well. To effect the kind of transformation which God displays and we desire. On a planet where population has grown beyond bounds, a warring way of life does not work anymore, writes Langle. Wars in the name of religion not only give religion a bad name, but they are a warning that it is time for us to move out of and beyond the old tribalism. Not easy, for it would seem that some form of tribalism is inherent in human nature. Science fiction writers often cast their characters in the old tribal mode, even when the tribe is the people of this planet and the neighbors, them, are from other planets. But everything we are learning about the nature of being is making it apparent that us versus them is a violation of creation. Tribalism must be transformed into community. We are learning from astrophysics and particle physics and cellular biology that all of creation exists only in interdependence and unity. The interrelationship of all of creation is sensitive. Physician Paul Brand, to whom Lengel refers, points out that every cell in the body has its own specific job. 
in interdependence with every other cell, the only cells which insist on being independent and autonomous are cancer cells. This desire for independence and autonomy was the essence of the relationship between Jacob and Esau, splitting them up even as they lay beside one another in Rebekah's womb. Both physically and emotionally, they were as different as night and day, choosing animosity over goodwill to describe their relationship to the world. I think it is unfortunately easy for all of us as individuals to relate to the initial choices that these two brothers made, and also easy for us as members of a particular religion and culture to relate to the warring nations that their story was intended to illustrate. Yet their hatred for one another, which we heard about in today's reading, will not be the end of the story. Later in Genesis, we will learn that Jacob and Esau are reconciled, a reconciliation that could only be accomplished through each of them giving up their powerful need to be right, in Jacob's case, or to be justified, in Esau's case. Each of them, from completely different perspectives, demonstrated a relinquishing of pride that can only be understood in light of what I earlier called God's unrelenting and unconditional desire to love us. The heavenly banquet cannot begin until we are all there, writes Lengel, and I can greet with love everybody who has caused me pain and call out a welcome to them all. The heavenly banquet cannot begin until all those whom I have hurt are ready to welcome me in all my flawed and contradictory humanness. Forgiveness, which leads to welcoming with open arms the forgiven ones to the party, comes less from an act of will than from a gift of grace. Herein lies the key to my being able to wake up to another day with a continuing will to approach the world with a loving heart rather than a cynical mind. In spite of the onslaught of bad news that too often greets us, I take comfort in both the unfolding biblical narrative and I would add an unfolding contemporary narrative, which tells me that God does indeed have the capacity to turn the world on its heels, if we would but take even the smallest steps to help make this happen. Amen. Jesus Christ, you give yourself to us. Now we give ourselves to you. Take, Take us, us, renew, and, and remake us. What, what we have been is past. What we shall be through you still awaits us. Lead us on. Take, Take us with you. you. Amen. Amen. Bless to us, O God, the moon that is above us, the earth that is beneath us, the friends who are around us, your image deep within us, the rest which is before us. Amen. Amen. Jesus. 
Jesus is fair. Jesus is pure. Who makes the troubled heart to see? There is the sunshine. There still the moonlight. And fill the twinkling. Jesus shines through.